I thank you all for coming and, uh, and attending. Uh, and I would also like uh, to thank my uh, hosts uh, and for, for the invitation. Um, maybe I will point in uh, here. Can, can you all see? Okay. So my name is uh, Ioannis Tsamardinos. I teach at the Computer Science Department in the University of uh, Crete. Uh, and today I'll be talking about uh, causal discovery and particularly the next generation of causal discovery which is integrative causal discovery meaning how we discover causalities like what is causing what not from a single source of uh, information but uh, from multiple ones so hence the integrative uh, part so usually <coughs> uh, I'm dealing with uh, data sets and data that come from uh, biology, um, medicine, sociology, uh, th this type of uh, sources, and they often look like this. Uh, they often look like two-dimensional tables where each row corresponds to one uh, patient, one tumor, one sample, uh, one object in general, and the columns correspond to different uh, quantities and variables. Now, uh, if you take uh, situations where a system of study like a human um, are observed, humans are observed, uh, you may have a doctor that, um, see, you may have a doctor, for example, that wants to study breast cancer and they measure like a set of potential risk factors uh, and then in a cohort of, uh, <clears throat> of patients. And then maybe you have another uh, biologist this time who also is interested in the same disease, breast cancer, but they measure molecular quantities or different quantities. Okay, so they study the same disease but different uh, features. And maybe some other uh, uh, medical expert like performs an experiment, an intervention. So they, they intervene and set uh, the values of one of these variables. And same thing for another data set. Okay, so this is a common situation where essentially lots of uh, studies are being performed for a, for a disease. And if you put all the data together, you see these big groups like of uh, missing variables. So uh, all these data sets come from different distributions. Okay, and usually what people do in 99.9% .9 of uh, standard machine learning and data mining is to analyze them independently. So the first doctor would analyze the data and try to find uh, risk factors associated with breast cancer. And the second biologist will find molecular quantities associated with breast cancer. And the other experimental data uh, will find uh, perhaps causes um, that are causing breast cancer. Okay, uh, and what happens is like these results are published in the literature and then it's the human brain, the human expert that will read these papers and try to figure out what is happening. So the question is, can we have automated smart algorithms that are going to figure out what is happening, not by synthesizing the text, but by synthesizing the, and analyzing the raw data. So if you try to pull all the data together, uh, <clears throat> you cannot do this naively because the data come from different distributions. For one thing, you have missing variables and there are theorems that these missing variables uh, you cannot impute without making additional um, uh, assumptions. You ca um, in statistics, they are called missing by design because we never thought about like measuring them. Uh, and also, you have different experimental conditions or in some cases, different sampling conditions. Some data sets may be case control, some other uh, may be cohort studies. So you cannot pull, pull them together, but uh, they all come, they have a common thing. They come from the same causal mechanism. That's uh, the distribution is different. The causal generating mechanism is the same. So the idea is that we try to identify the causal graphs, all causal graphs that simultaneously fit all the data. So uh, when you have one data set, uh, the problem of causal discovery is to, uh, to figure out like what is causing what. What is the data generating mechanism? And this is extremely important. Uh, if you want to design a drug, you want to intervene on the things that cause the disease. 
Okay, if you want to, if you apply this in business, you want to have a promotion or you have to intervene somehow to the things that affect the behavior of your clients. So for a, a lot of applications, uh, knowledge of causality is uh, crucial. Um, we have to go beyond the mere associations and statistical and predictive models. In this case, though, we try to do uh, an extra step and combine all sources of information to figure out the causal, um, uh, causalities. Okay, so first, <coughs> um, I'm going to present a very brief introduction to the field, conceptual introduction. Uh, how do we model causality? We use a, a set of models that are called semi-Markov causal models. And they have their graphs. Uh, the variables are represented as vertices and, and nodes. Um, and the edges correspond, the directed edges like this correspond to uh, direct causality where nothing mediates, uh, none of the observables uh, mediates this uh, causation. The bidirected edges correspond to the presence of a latent confounding factor that we, cannot, that we don't measure and that causes both of these uh, variables. So bidirected, with bidirected, we denote the fact that neither uh, y causes x nor vice versa, but there is a third missing variable here that causes both. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, these are the type of graphs that we are going to be using. And you could have potentially here another edge, like uh, a directed edge, denoting the fact that there's a latent variable between these two and x is causing y, for example. But we do not allow uh, cycles and feedback. Uh, we can discuss this like uh, later, but for the moment, we don't. Now, this is the data generating mechanism. And then you have the joint probability distribution, the numbers. OK, now it is the case that um, so what, what is the thing that connects the two? It cannot be the case that you have a causal model uh, that generates like th these numbers, and these numbers can be just anything. So <clears throat> what connects the two are assumptions about what we mean about the, uh, the nature of causality, okay? The causal assumptions that we're going to use. And, and the causal assumptions cons based on given a graph constrained the probabilities that we're going to see. Uh, these constraints are going to be expressed in the form of dependencies, conditional dependencies and independencies. So an independence uh, of x with y given uh, some other set of variables z denotes that if we know the value of z, we have, or we believe, and we have a probability distribution for x. And even if we find something additional, even if we find uh, the value of y, uh, these probabilities do not change. And dependence means that y does give us additional information, does change these probabilities, even if we know z, or precisely when we know z. So conditional independence and dependence are going to be uh, key. We're going to express the causal assumptions based on these dependencies and independencies. And essentially, the main assumption uh, we use in causal discovery is that every variable is independent of its non-effects given its direct uh, causes. Uh, this captures like several scenarios at once that people find intuitive about causality. For example, it captures the scenario that if uh, you know the direct causes of something, indirect causes don't give you additional information. Okay, this is a special case of this uh, assumption. So let's see uh, how it's applied here. Uh, let's say for Z, <clears throat> the direct causes are X in this case. So uh, Z given X is independent, should be independent. We expect to be independent in the data from its non-effect. Uh, it doesn't have any effect, so everything else is a non-effect. So we expect Y and Z to be independent given Z. Now the uh, based on our intuition and our assumptions about causality. And um, another assumption that we often make is the causal faithfulness assumption. It means that all the independencies that you observe in your data stem from the causality. They're not accidentally, don't accidentally appear there. So 
or with this assumption, we expect everything else to be dependent, conditionally dependent. These are the two main assumptions that we are going to use. Now, um, it is the case that based on the independencies stemming from the Markov uh, condition uh, and the axioms of probability, you could um, prove other uh, independencies. But there is a very nice theorem uh, and a very nice criterion, graphical criterion, called M separation that allows you, when you see a graph like that, to determine what dependencies and independencies to expect in your data. So it's a, it's a criterion that tells you how to go from the graph to the data. And uh, this is the formal definition. The criterion, first of all, defines uh, a set of paths that are called M connecting, uh, and every, every other path is M separating. M connecting paths intuitively allow information to flow. M separating paths, or not M connecting paths, uh, stop information from flowing. So if there is at least one M connecting path, then you would expect dependence. And if there's no M connecting path, you expect independence. So let's see how these M connecting paths are defined. For, uh, first of all, there <coughs> you take a path from X1 to Xn, and it's M connecting given some other variables, condition on some other variables. Uh, if the following holds, uh, you take every triplet of uh, variables. How do you? Which? It won't show up on the screen. Ah, it won't show up? OK. So you take every triplet of, uh, of variables on the path. Uh, and of course, they're connected uh, by edges. Use, use the mouse. Yeah, that, that's OK. And <coughs> you separate uh, between two cases. One is you have two incoming arrows on the triplet, and the other one is you don't. If you have two incoming arrows, uh, we call this a collider, and essentially information flows only when you condition on the collider or descendants of the collider. Otherwise, information doesn't flow. Uh, this, this is the main asymmetry that uh, is induced by causal assumptions, and this asymmetry will uh, determine the, um, uh, the arrows, the directionality of, of causation. This is implicitly what allows the algorithms to figure out that uh, so, some edges are this way and not some other configuration. So what's M for that? What does M say? Which M? M ah, why is it M? Yeah. It's for mixed uh, graphs. Oh. That's where it comes from, order. mixed graphs. Okay, so uh, now if we, know, if we know the causal graph, we can use the theorem and figure out the M connections and M separations and uh, figure out what independencies and conditional dependencies and independence to expect in the data. Okay, so if you have the causal model, we know what to expect in the data, but of course what we're trying to do is like go from the data to the causal graph do solve the reverse engineering problem. Well, from the data, we could like uh, determine whether certain dependencies and independencies hold. We can use statistical uh, conditional independence tests, perform a lot of them, uh, and figure out like uh, whether certain associations, conditional associations hold or not. So the question is like, how do we figure out a graph that, you know, is consistent with all that? Okay. So for one thing, like you may have lots of solutions, lots of graphs that are uh, consistent. So you have to, they're called Markov equivalents, and you have to consider that. So lots of solutions in the general uh, case. Uh, and at least when you have one data set, uh, there are algorithms that have been uh, uh, proposed and investigated for the last 30 years or more, uh, sound and complete that take as input the data and give you the set of uh, solutions. And they're relatively efficient. So this is kind of like that was the state of the art uh, like five, six years ago. Now the question is like, <clears throat> uh, how do you go from multiple such data sets that measure like uh, uh, overlapping sets of variables and they are uh, 
sampled under different interventions or under different selection bias and you find the graphs that uh, satisfy the constraints. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let me explain first of all like how we model interventions when you do an experiment. In, uh, uh, these are called clinical trials in uh, medicine and they're called A-B testing in uh, business. For example, they, they, they change like the way the layout is in a web page or something else. They, they make a small intervention. So for example here, uh, let's say we do a study and uh, the intervention is that you randomize, you take a, a set of people, you randomize to two groups, you feed one uh, with junk food, let's say, and the other one without. This is better done with uh, mice instead of people, but okay. And then you measure the, you measure the proportion of people who got like a heart disease. Okay, this is how they do interventions in medicine. Now, how do we model this uh, with our causal graphs? If you know the causal graph, uh, say this is food intake in, the, in our example, uh, which uh, is determined and caused by many factors like uh, from your genes to your social economic status. Uh, once you do the randomization, then it's the experimenter who determines the value of what you're eating. So nothing else now uh, determines the value of what you're eating. So we drop from this graph, we have to drop the edges that are incoming to B, and that's how you model, as it's called, hard interventions. Uh, and we denote the, the graph with G uh, superscript B. Okay, so basically when you have a data set and you know you have made an intervention to B, then you're looking for a graph uh, with these constraints that they have to be some M, con M connections and M separations, but after you consider dropping some edges, okay? So that's the difference in the problem definition now. Now let's go to selection bias. This is something very important but often completely ignored. Say you have a business uh, here in Raleigh and obviously the clients are sampled mostly from the population in Raleigh which may have a different distribution of certain features than some other uh, population. <laughs> now, this selection bias creates some spurious associations. Uh, in this example, maybe we're doing uh, some survey and we sample from people with, uh, that are from the Internet. We, we do it on the Internet. So we're mostly sampling Internet users and the distribution of some features there, the, the red people from the... Uh, black people, uh, it may be different than the distribution of these colors in the general population. But this is due to the sampling procedure. It's not due to an actual association in the general population. How do we model this with causal uh, models? We have, uh, we introduce a new variable, uh, S, which denotes the probability that an object is included in our samples. So for all our samples, in all our data, you can think of S uh, being, uh, taking the value of 1. Now, if the, the probability of sampling something depends on some variables in our model, then we connect uh, here. Uh, a common situation in uh, medicine is uh, with selection bias, with, with known selection bias, is case control studies, where you select 100 people with the disease, and 100 people without the disease. The probability of selecting depends on having the disease or not. It's much higher if you have the disease for a rare disease. For example, in, if you're studying like a rare form of cancer, you may include all your patients uh, with a disease that you see in a year. So it, it could be 100%. And of course, it's much lower for non, um, for controls. So it, then the associations in this graph that you're going to see in your data are conditioned on S being 1. And if you use the M separation, you'll, you know that uh, you will observe in your data spurious associations, okay, that are not in the general population. So this is how you model that, and uh, then your constraints 
change and, and they determine that you have M connections and M separation constraints, path constraints, in a, in a graph where you take into consideration that uh, you sample differently. You, uh, <coughs> okay? So um, now you have all this data. You can determine a bunch of uh, independencies and dependencies. You have constraints on the paths, uh, what type of paths you expect in your graphs. Uh, the, okay, and the question is, how do you figure out, how do you solve this problem? It's uh, quite complicated. So our idea was to convert the problem to a logical, um, a logic uh, problem in, in first order logic or propositional logic. So let's see how we do that. Uh, well, here's a small example. Suppose you know nothing about the causal structure of these three variables. But you find uh, that in a uh, data set where you manipulate B, you find a single independence, A with C given the empty set. So uh, you know that in a graph where you remove all edges into B, uh, there should not be an M connecting path between A and C. OK, how do we solve this? Uh, what we do is like we defined propositional variables that denote the presence or absence of edges. So this is a propositional variable, true or false, denoting that uh, the edge uh, from, there is an edge, directed edge from A to C, or from C to A, or uh, bidirected edge AC. Okay? So this cannot exist, otherwise uh, we could like, th there would always be an M connecting path. And also this configuration cannot exist because it can, uh, even when you remove edges into B, that are known here, uh, you would still have an M connecting path. So you have these two constraints which you can uh, generate automatically and they're satisfied if this uh, formula, propositional formula, is true. Okay, so this is an interesting application of logic programming in a very statistical problem. Okay, so you have your solution and you run like some uh, satisfiability engine or um, answer set programming or some other uh, constraint uh, satisfaction engine. And for example, it assigns values to these uh, variables, to these variables, uh, true to blue ones, false to red ones, and they correspond to this structure. So this structure comes from this assignment which satisfies the constraints and essentially gives you a solution, a data set, a co uh, I'm sorry, a, a causal graph that fits your data. So <clears throat> we try to do this like uh, automatically for when you have a, a large set of data sets uh, and you have to consider also selection bias and uh, interventions. And we ca came up with this uh, algorithm uh, that takes as input as many conditional independencies and dependencies that you want to input and you can compute on your data uh, from multiple data sets, if so desired. It takes some meta information about the data sets, which are uh, specifically for each variable in a given data set, whether we know it was used for selection, as it would be the case for a case control study, uh, or we know it wasn't, or it's unknown. You can set it to anything you want. And same thing for uh, experiments. You, set, you tell the algorithm whether a variable in a given data set was manipulated by an experimenter or not, or we don't know. If you don't know, the algorithm is going to try to prove uh, whether it has to be manipulated or not, for example, or it has to be selected upon. And you can also incorporate structural uh, prior knowledge like, uh, for example, that I know A causes B directly or indirectly or nothing causes C or something like this. Uh, then what we do in the algorithm is define a bunch of uh, propositional variables. This is the variable that in the unknown sought after graph, X is directly causing Y or X uh, and Y have a latent confounder, and some uh, uh, auxiliary variables like X and Y have a um, 
a directed path essentially. Here's a variable uh, that denotes that X and Y given Z are M connected in dataset D. So in logic programs, there's no clear separation between input and output. But usually the way you would use this is you test uh, in your data sets the uh, dependencies and dependencies that correspond to M connections or M separations. So you set a bunch of these things to true or false based on your data. Then, uh, as I said, if you have information about selection bias, you set some of these variables to true or, or false, or you just leave it unknown. If you have some information about uh, interventions, you set some of these variables to true or false or unknown. And then uh, we impose in a logic program uh, the constraints. And you end up like this complicated problem is solved with a 10-line logic program that is this one. Okay, that says, for example, that encodes the definition of M connections that I showed before as a mathematical definition. It's encoded here as a logic program. Uh, plus, we impose constraints on ancestry and acyclicity and, um, and things like that. Okay, so you solve this problem, then uh, some of uh, these variables here will take the value of yet, true or false, and that means uh, they have to be there in any solution. Okay? Now, uh, if you actually try to do this uh, conceptually, I think it's relatively simple, but in practice, the number of dependencies and independencies is exponential, the number of paths is exponential, the number of solutions is exponential, everything is exponential, as every interesting problem in AI uh, everything is exponential, okay? Uh, so you need a lot of <coughs> technical, smart uh, things to do, like um, uh, theorems that prune out the search space or heuristics or approximations and things like that. Um, like, um, <coughs> for example, for the number of paths, you can, only re you can restrict the length of the paths that you consider uh, in your constraints. So you lose uh, completeness, uh, but gain a, a lot in uh, speed. Uh, now, the, the logic formula, also uh, the way you encode these constraints is very important. Uh, okay. <clears throat> but one thing uh, I'm going to mention is how uh, you deal with an exponential number of solutions. Well, instead of enumerating them all, what we do is sometimes we... Um, uh, summarize all solutions in the following way. You can summarize the pairwise uh, relations between the variables. So you, qu uh, you can figure out by, by graphing the following. You, you put solid edges if uh, an edge is present in all solutions. You can put uh, dust edges if it's present only in some solutions and missing in others, this edge. Uh, the absent edges mean also that they, they're absent in all solutions. So absent and solid edges uh, essentially are invariant features upon which all solutions agree. Okay? And uh, uh, same thing here, for example, some solutions uh, have uh, another arrow and some don't. That's one way to uh, summarize your uh, results. Another way would be if you care about a specific thing, like is X causing Y, you can query the logic program and say, can you prove that X causes Y? Uh, and if it, um, or can you prove that X uh, doesn't cause Y? And uh, depending on the answer, you get the information that you want. Now, another technical uh, intricacy is that in here, you uh, almost surely are going to have like uh, statistical errors from your tests. And this is going to give you conflicting constraints, which is going to give you a satisfied uh, formulas, uh, and nothing is going to work. So you need a, a way to resolve conflicts. Well, the way we do that is somehow you rank your conflicts, maybe on p-values or um, 
you convert your p-values to probabilities, a posteriori probabilities, and you try to satisfy only a subset of your constraints, uh, optimizing maybe the weight of the probabilities or the log of the weights, um, and so forth. Okay, uh, we introduced this approach uh, in 2010, and there's been a, a body of work that is accumulating since uh, with increasing complexity and increasing uh, and, and encompassing more and more types of heterogeneity of uh, data sets. Um, and, and the logic, uh, conversion to logic, allows us to solve really complicated pro uh, problems that we're not, uh, we were not able to find algorithms for before. Okay, um, so this is, this is some more work, uh, the, a complete or a more complete coverage of this uh, new field uh, essentially is um, in a recent tutorial that we gave in a, a UAI 2016. Uh, let me also uh, mention these two works. Uh, this work um, also tries to quantify this, uh, uh, these causalities that, that uh, you find in the graphs. So it's, ve it's very interesting from, from that perspective. And, and this work is also a massive proof of uh, concept that we ran on real data in 2012 uh, and all shows that you can actually do some interesting things like uh, with these techniques on real data. Okay, uh, <clears throat> even if you totally miss the technical details, let me go through a very quick and small example uh, hopefully making these things uh, clear. So this is a causal model that some expert in the insurance domain has built, okay? Um, in the insurance domain, they have uh, different type of costs, like medical costs, liability, and property costs. They would like to reduce them. They would like to figure out what uh, should we do uh, to reduce them, not just predict them, but affect the costs. Uh, this is part of the causal model that he created. Um, so now we generate data from this model and we hide the model from the algorithm and see what the algorithm can reconstruct in terms of causalities and, and compare the two. So this is our gold standard, but the algorithm only sees data, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, now we also uh, simulate the following scenario. Let's say we have an observational data set uh, where we measure all the variables in the graph I showed you, except these two. So you have some latent variables. Um, then you have a case control study, essentially uh, a study where uh, you sample people with anti-locks and an equal number of people without anti-locks. So uh, there is selection bias, we know it, and some other variables are missing. Uh, let's say that the business, after, uh, you know, they've been gathering data, they did some ad advertising. That's a form of soft intervention. So they did some advertising, uh, tried to instigate to people to put some better cushioning uh, on their cars uh, to reduce medical costs in, uh, once an accident occurs. Um, so again, this is the same business and you have like uh, similar latent variables. And let's also assume we have some prior information. Uh, the costs uh, don't cause anything because they come after everything you measure. Not, uh, age uh, cost, um, causes costs and nothing causes the age, for example, okay? So let's, we input like um, some of these things. We input the observational only data to the algorithm and query what direct or indirect causal relationships can you prove they have to be there. And as you can see, you can actually prove a lot of them. Okay, so you can prove, I don't know, that um, cushioning causally affects medical costs and, and things like that. You can go beyond uh, associations, all right? Now, if in addition to that, you put some prior knowledge, then you can refine and prove even more information, okay? Uh, for example, you can prove that uh, before age was causing medical costs directly, 
now you can prove actually it's a more elaborate like path. If you add all information and prior uh, knowledge, all, all the data sets, you can actually prove that some of the causal relationships are direct, nothing intervenes, okay? And there are even more of them. On top of that, if you make other uh, queries, you're going to discover something re uh, counterintuitive uh, that, that uh, very few algorithms, I think, are uh, able to do. You can discover that, for example, medical cost doesn't cause ruggedness or vice versa. But if you notice the example very carefully, there is no data set where these two are simultaneously measured. So you make an inference between two things that are never uh, in, your same, uh, in the same data set. You cannot even compute a correlation or anything. Okay? Uh, and yet, I mean, using these ideas, you can prove something uh, for these two variables. Okay, so the key points is um, that basically we use the fact that some distributions may be different, but they come from the same causal system. And then we try to find what's this causal system. Uh, and this way we can handle uh, heterogeneous data sets measuring different variables uh, under different experimental conditions or sampling conditions. Uh, we convert the problem, the main uh, idea to solve the problem is to convert it to logic and exploit more than 40 years of hard work in constraint satisfaction. And let me say that these engines are, are fantastic, absolutely. Uh, and we use a query-based approach to avoid the explosion of uh, possible solutions. The vision of this work is eventually to have algorithms that are able to handle all sorts of data sets, all sorts of information. And instead of like analyzing one data set at a time that we mostly do in machine learning, be able to reconstruct the causal model of a system like the human from uh, many sources. Uh, I would really like to thank uh, our hosting institutions, funding agencies, uh, my students and, and postdocs and, and uh, also like uh, collaborators. And I can also give you like a, uh, some sneak preview if you'd like to uh, other projects we work on. Do, do I have like uh, yes. three, four minutes? Yeah, you have, uh, like, I think you have five to ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like very quickly. Just, just the topics. Okay, so one, of course, direction is like uh, keep working on this, uh, include, uh, improve the scalability, the robustness uh, to, for example, statistical errors, um, relax the assumptions of uh, uh, causal discovery, uh, try to make quantitative predictions, not just discover A causes B, but the strength of uh, this causal effect, uh, be able to use uh, temporal data, and actually, we are going to be working with a big company on a real application in, uh, in insurance. Okay, uh, other than that, like to more classical types of uh, problems, we've been working to, uh, on, on feature selection for big data and small data. Uh, so <clears throat> we have improved the computational performance by one to three orders of magnitude for the standard uh, forward backward selection algorithm. And now uh, we have incorporated some uh, ideas how to make this work for big data where you have a matrix of tens of millions times tens of millions of, uh, tens of millions of million features, tens of millions um, samples. Uh, another very interesting uh, for me dimension is to learn the type of causal models, n uh, not like the ones I showed you, that are essentially statistical graphical models, probabilistic graphical models, but the type of causal models people use in engineering and uh, physics. And these are, some of them are in the form of ordinary differential equations. And the question is like, how do you learn from data both the structure, both the form of the equations and the parameters? Uh, the, the work on, in this area focused only at estimating parameters, oh, for the large, uh, larger part, estimating parameters, 
given the structure. Uh, we incorporate uh, our algorithms to this uh, package in R, if you would like to use them. Uh, mainly what it contains now, and we keep extending it, is uh, algorithms for variable selection, some uh, basic algorithms for uh, learning causal models of the form, uh, the simplest form, uh, Bayesian networks. And uh, we'll keep in including like uh, more as time goes by. Uh, also, uh, for um, predictive modeling, we are building and we're very interested in building tools that automatically do predictive modeling from data. And that means uh, that they automatically uh, tune the hyperparameters, estimate performance, uh, tune the algorithms that you use and their combination, how you combine them together, um, uh, how you estimate confidence intervals, and, and these type of things. Uh, here are some applications. The, the idea is that you load the data and you specify, for example, whether you want to do classification, regression, or time uh, to event analysis, uh, how much effort you want to let the computer spend on uh, optimizing the algorithms and the models, and that's, that's all. Um, okay. And uh, since we're working a lot in medicine and biology, we also uh, create uh, uh, visual uh, tools for uh, being able to run these uh, causal discovery algorithms and more standard analysis algorithms on uh, um, a new type of data that are called single cell, and specifically mass cytometry and flow cytometry. Uh, I don't know if any of you like works on um, biological data. Yeah. All right. Okay, this is it. Um, thank you very much for your attendance. And uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? So, yes. Uh, I'm very naive on causal analysis, but I recently read some articles about the, you know, causal analysis and, uh, you know, one of the gurus, uh, uh, Judy Pell, uh, said that, yeah. uh, the comment that uh, if you, uh, with any assumptions, you can, you can use your mod data to fit any causal uh, uh, relationships. Uh, I just wonder, like in your, in your case, you say that there are exponential uh, uh, many uh, solutions, like the graphical models, to fit the data. Uh, what's right. the minimal uh, assumption you, you should uh, pose for the constraints? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the question is, uh, I guess in a more general sense, what is a reasonable set of assumptions? So under no assumptions, anything is possible. Uh, and this is also true, I think, for uh, the general induction problem by Hume. I mean, if you don't make any assumptions, you cannot learn anything. I may be dropping like... Uh, a pen a million times. Uh, and if I don't make the assumption that the future is going to be similar to the past, I can infer nothing, right? Um, that's like a 17th century problem in philosophy. So you got to make some assumptions. Um, the fewer assumptions you make, the more solutions you have. The more strict assumptions you make, the more you can infer uh, and the, the, the fewer solutions you have, but uh, you may be wrong about your assumptions. What is the most appropriate set? I mean, it's, it's very hard, but um, I, I would say the causal uh, Markov condition uh, is essential. The, the fact that uh, um, direct causes or causes that are closer, uh, like direct causes, um, are immediate, okay? Direct causes give you more information than indirect causes. So that's a very basic assumption that, that we make, which could be violated if you're not measuring the true causes but noisy versions of them. So, um, so we try to relax them, but again, not too much. And uh, depending on which set you are willing to accept, you get a different set of algorithms and s solutions.
One assumption that uh, people were making, uh, and is the most uh, a very common assumption, but I believe it should be dropped, is the fact that you don't have any latent confounding, uh, confounders, no latent variables. This is the assumption you make when you learn Bayesian networks, essentially. Uh, and this is very common in the field, but I, I believe we should go to more complicated models not making the assumption. Hence, we use the semi-Markov uh, causal models. Any other question? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, pertaining particularly to your uh, medical uh, data analysis, uh, I can't help but think, how do I validate the, this, you know, and, and, and evaluate basically or assess the robustness uh, of these uh, approaches, particularly in a, in a big data, you know, a big data a medical uh, setting. Right. So the, the, the question is, I, I guess, again, in a more general sense, is how do you evaluate in, uh, this, these algorithms, right? Because right. uh, you cannot do the usual tricks that we do in, uh, in, in machine learning where you hold out the set and uh, do cross-validation or something like this. This is not going to work here, okay? Because what you, essentially what you're predicting is what's going to happen if you change something and you don't have this in your data, the experiment. Uh, so the ideal validation is to actually go ahead and do the, te the experiment. That's the, the gold standard. You would have to do perform an experiment. Now, in uh, business, sometimes you can actually perform maybe testing, as they call it. In biology, you could do like experiment with experiments with uh, uh, animals. Uh, in medicine, you could do experiments with, uh, not with humans, but with cells. Like uh, maybe you take some, some cells and you experiment on the cells. For instance, in the biological uh, setting, uh -huh. uh, uh, have you actually... Uh, Performed any yeah, experiments? Yeah, cross, uh, no, no, but we have, we have funding to perform some. So as soon as we have like some uh, reliable predictions that we're sure about, we're going to send uh, the biologists to do that. Uh, nevertheless, this, uh, other people have done that. They have predicted, for example, genes that are causing obesity or a type of obesity in, uh, in mice. And they uh, painstakingly, you know, they, they did the gene modifications and they showed uh, that it did have effect in obesity. So they have actually done some of the experiments. A second form of validation would be to see if you can at least retrieve the things that you know for in the literature. So people go to the uh, known uh, pa uh, pathways, biological pathways, or known causal relationships in the uh, literature and see if they can retrieve that stuff. If you cannot even do that or uh, don't, don't trust it, uh, or before you do that, you can run a lot of simulations. So you, sim uh, you start with a known causal model, simulate data, and see if, you can, if the algorithms can reconstruct it. And that's the most common way to develop uh, algorithms. And there's a third one uh, that we used uh, here, a, a last one that we used here, where, I mean, uh, I don't have time to, to go through here, but uh, we make predictions based on causal theories between variables that were never jointly measured in, a, in two data sets. And then we go to a third data set where you measure both and see if uh, the predictions were correct. So we use causal algorithms to make predictions about associations, um, but in, in a scenario, in a difficult scenario where you don't have measurements, uh, joint measurements of two variables. So that was a massive kind of uh, uh, a way to massively test uh, these uh, causal uh, techniques uh, if, if they give some, uh, something interesting and correct. All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. All right. Well, thank you very much.
Wh where is this other room? Uh, they have. Uh, it's uh, in Greensboro. 50 miles away. 50 miles. Is Greensboro 50 miles away? Yeah. May, may I